Hi everybody, welcome back to our channel. Today I'm going to be teaching you how to design an off-grid or standalone irrigation system for your garden. Complete with rain collection, solar power, filtering, and putting everything on a timer. Just like the system we are using behind me for our 40 by 80 foot garden. I'm going to be showing you how to size all of your components and how to keep your system flexible as your garden grows. Let's start off with an overview of our garden plan and how I selected the components to fit our system. So let's start by taking a look at this CAD model I created of our garden. I created this CAD model to visualize the elevation change in our garden plot and also to look at how we wanted to set up our fencing. Now I understand that most people are not going to have access to software like this, so I'm just simply showing you this to demonstrate where you would want to place your source of rain collection. You're going to want to place your source of rain collection at the highest point of elevation. This will enable you to use gravity to your advantage and assist the pump as well as extend the life of your pump by eliminating head pressure by pumping uphill. Whenever I start a project of this scale, uh, I like to take quite a bit of time and either make a simple CAD model or detailed sketch to visualize what I'm trying to achieve and just ensure that the design makes sense. I tend to be more of a visual learner, so this helps me work through the design process and just incorporate ideas or show me flaws that I need to sort out. In this case, after reviewing the CAD model, we decided to place a faucet on the back side of our shed and this just allows us to access fresh rainwater from inside the garden. We also added a door to the shed to retrieve tools. This way once we enter the garden we don't have to worry about like leaving the garden door open and letting our hungry little furry friends in when we're not looking. So let's move over to Excel now and start the process of sizing out our irrigation system. Here we are with Excel opened up and I'm going to start by calculating the irrigation tubing lengths first. I'm going to calculate the amount of rows we're going to have, and in this case, as you can see by the picture, we had already formed our raised garden rows, so there's no need for me to figure that part out. We have 11 of the 36 foot beds and 8 of the 14 foot beds. Each row has two runs of drip irrigation emitter tubing split off from the main trunk. These lines were sized at half inch OD, and we chose 9 inch spacing for the emitters based on the crop spacing of what we were planting. Emitter tubing is offered in a variety of different flow rates and emitter spacing. I re definitely recommend checking out dripebo.com for a wide selection of irrigation parts. We're going to start out by multiplying the garden row total by the number of tubing runs per row. And we will get our total tubing feet. Then we're going to convert feet to inches for total tubing length in inches. And then we can bring in the tubing selection we made previously which had one emitter every nine inches. We then divide by the total length in inches by 9, and this will give us the approximate total of emitters in our system. We're going to need this number to calculate the flow in our design. For the tubing, we're going to need to convert to feet for the length and then round up to the nearest total length we need to purchase. This will vary depending on what size rolls the supplier you're purchasing from sells. I'd like to go ahead and add 10% to the calculated length in order to ensure that we're not short as we will be making a lot of cuts and wasting some material. In our case we purchased a thousand feet of the half inch emitter tubing and 100 feet of the three quarter inch main run tubing from driftybow.com with all of our fittings. Let's talk about the fittings real quick and then come back to finishing the flow calculations. As you see in this image circled in white there is a half inch line with no emitters coming off the three quarter inch main trunk. We inserted a ball valve or shutoff valve circled in green into this section so that each garden row could be shut off and we could spot irrigate as we wished. We then teed off the half inch line circled in yellow and then each branch makes a 90 degree turn into the emitter tubing which is circled in red. These lines run the entire length of beds and then are capped with a half inch plug and a worm clamp. Looking at this image you can see that each bed needs one shut off valve, two elbows, two end clamps a half inch T and one half inch to three quarter inch T fitting as well as 14 of the worm clamps. This setup is multiplied 19 times to give you the fitting totals in our case. Don't forget to add three quarter inch end caps or three quarter inch T fittings if you intend to split the trunk as we did in our garden. Now that we have our fitting sorted out and we also have the length of tubing determined, let's calculate the total flow in our system. We multiply our emitter rate, which in our case was one gallon per hour, by the total amount of emitters. This gave us a total flow rate of 1,355 gallons per hour. As pumps are usually specified in gallons per minute, we will need to convert this number. 
go ahead and divide the gallons per hour by 60 minutes and then we get 23 gallons per minute. We decided to go ahead and make a judgment call at this point and say that we were only going to need one quarter of this flow rate. This is due to the estimation that not all of our seedlings are planted at the same time. We were thinking that once the seedlings were established, we could water by sections or individual rows if needed. This saved us money up front, but I will come back to this later and talk about this estimation when I talk about improvements I would make to the system. Otherwise, you would want to go ahead and use the 23 gallons per minute to select your pump. Moving back to the calculations, we need to divide the 23 gallons per minute by one quarter usage, and this gives us roughly 6 gallons per minute and a usage of 85 gallons per 15 minute watering cycle. Now that we have the flow rate and total usage, Let's quickly see how fast our shed roof can recover our water levels. We multiply 8 by 16 feet giving us the square footage of the roof and then multiply this by 144 which is square inches per square foot to get us a total of 18,432 square inches. So a 1 inch total rainfall will then yield us 18,432 cubic inches of water. There are 231 cubic inches of water in a gallon so a quick google search provides us a conversion from 18,432 cubic inches to 79.8 gallons of water. So it would take just over an inch of rain to recover from a 15 minute watering with the system. I can tell you from a few months experience with the system that this is a very close estimate to actuality. So let's move on to selecting a pump. Now solar systems typically run off of 12 volts, but you can add an inverter to convert 12 volts to 110 volts and run a bigger pump or to broaden your selection of different types of pumps. Let's look at trying to use a 12 volt pump that can flow around our 6 gallons per minute requirement. My intent for the system is to be on a timer, so it would be nice to use a pump that can be internally or externally controlled. It just so happens that there's a wide variety of options out there for RV water pumps, which turn on when the water pressure drops and shut off when the water pressure rises, like when someone's using a sink. Seaflow is a reputable brand. There are other direct competitors out there that I have not tried, but I chose to use a 5.5 gallon per minute, 12 volt Seaflow pump. I will leave a link in the description where you can find this pump on that jungle website everyone is familiar with. Next, we're gonna need a hose splitter. I used a few plastic ones that kept breaking, so it broke down and I went with brass. This is where we split the water supply to the faucet or out to the irrigation. Adding the faucet here is as simple as hooking up any length of hose to the splitter and then tying to a faucet wherever you like. Coming out of one half of the splitter, we will go through a 25 PSI pressure regulator. This is important so that we don't blow out or ruin the emitters in the irrigation system. We will then run the water through a 120 mesh disc filter. This will catch anything that may clog the emitters down the line. We can then add a hose timer to start and stop our system whenever we choose. At this point, the components just need to be tied together in the drip irrigation system, and then you are all set. If you are hooking up a faucet, the pump will automatically turn on when you open the faucet or spray water from the hose. The pump will also turn on when the timer goes off and it senses a loss of pressure. Once the timer shuts off, it will back up pressure to the pump, shutting off the pump. A quick note about these style of pumps. They do not like to be run at a trickle. They will try and they will pulse on and off very fast and you will likely burn out the pump a lot faster than normal use. By normal use, I mean just letting the timer control the pump or opening the faucet a full turn. I also chose to add a coarse inline filter right out of the tank before the pump to catch any large particles that may damage the pump. This is optional, but I would advise using one. There are multiple thread adapters that are needed here I purchased all of them from Lowe's and they can all easily be found in the plumbing section as well as the irrigation parts should you need them. Before we move on to talking about what powers this system, let's quickly talk about how we collect the rainwater from the shed roof. First, the rainwater is strained by the leaf feeder where large debris is removed and kept from entering the system. The water then travels down the first section of 4 inch PVC, past the T fitting and through a section that necks down to a 2 inch diameter. PVC then winds back up to a 4 inch diameter. Inside of this particular 4 inch section is a 2.5 inch plastic ball. This section of tubing will fill up with the initial rainfall entering the system. The plastic ball will start to float as the water rises until it comes into contact with the neck down area. Once it contacts the neck, it will plug the bottom portion of PVC and divert the clean rainwater into the IBC totes. This water can be then drained out of the bottom and there are several ways of achieving this. Some people choose to use a drip fitting and simply drip out this dirty water over time. 
I choose to use a ball valve, that way we can use this water in the garden first before consuming the clean water in our totes. Now, let's move on to talking about solar. The main source of draw from the system is going to be the pump. I did decide to add lights to our garden, but as you will see, their contribution to power draw is quite low compared to the pump. Current draw for the pump is 8 amps, so let's multiply that by 12 volts to get 96 watts. So theoretically, a 100 watt solar panel can power this pump all by itself. Let's look at a simple solar kit from Renogy and see what we are working with. This 100 watt kit comes with a charge controller, which does exactly as its name suggests. It also allows you to connect your load like a pump directly to it or to connect a battery. Its data sheet states that this system can charge at a rate of 500 watts per day or 20.8 watts per hour. So this should work quite well. It also comes with all the cabling we need, plus a fuse and the ability to add a Bluetooth controller slash monitor if you would like. Knowing we are running multiple sources from the system and that I also want to draw on the system at times where it cannot be charged like at night, if we add a small Life Peel 4 battery, we can do just that. Let's see if a 30 amp hour battery will do the trick. 30 amp hour divided by 8 amps is going to be 3.75 hours of runtime for this pump. Plus, our 20.8 watts per hour from the panel will consistently be trying to charge the battery. We have plenty of headroom to work with here. If you aren't familiar with some of the small details like the difference between a Life PO4 and a conventional battery or a mono versus polycrystalline type solar panel, I encourage you to do a bit of research and learn which is best for your use. For my application, I'm going to be running a 100 watt monocrystal panel and a 30 amp hour battery that we just looked into. All right, so we're back up here to the garden and uh, I wanted to just go over a couple things about this system, um, some learnings that we've had in the last five months of using it, uh, both solar and the irrigation. The first thing that I would change is the pump. Um, right now, the initial pump that we bought for the system was a three gallon per hour Seaflow pump. Um, it actually works really well. Um, we only run about four or five different beds at a time when doing the irrigation. So we kind of do what I talked about earlier in spot irrigation. Uh, if we were going to be running the whole system like we are going to be next year, I'm gonna to have to upgrade the pump. It's just not gonna be enough. But as far as running the faucet and running a few beds here or there, it absolutely works fine. Um, the drip irrigation tubing, um, we haven't had any issues with that. We've had a couple clogs here or there, uh, a couple punctures we have to fix, but no big deal. And as for the rainwater collection, you know, it's, um, it's been a tricky year here in Tennessee. It's been very dry. Last year we moved to Tennessee and it was very wet. People were having a hard time, you know, just growing crops because it was so wet. Everything was just rotting. It's the absolute opposite this year. It's very, very dry. So earlier this spring, we were able to fill both of these totes up and keep them filled up for about a month or so. And then since then, it's just become more and more, um, more of a drought. And we've actually run both of these totes, which are 275 gallons each, right down to the bottom. So I've actually had to collect water from the house uh, twice now. And what I'm looking at doing is... When I talked about at the beginning of this video, the system being expandable, I can add a third tote right to this, no problem, and just glue in a couple more feet of PVC, attach everything together, and then you have a larger capacity. Now, that doesn't help the fact that we're not getting rain, but what would happen is over the course of the winter or the spring months, I could build up that capacity. Our other option is the barn. Uh, I plan on setting up at least three totes like this, at least 275 gallons a piece on the barn and then siphon off of the barn and, and bring it up here. Um, not physically siphon, but um, you know, sump out of those and bring it up here. That will likely be what happens in another month or two. I'm going to move towards doing that, setting up the, the rain collection on the barn first, and then we'll move towards doing solar and stuff on the barn. As for the solar, the 100 watt Renogy kit, absolutely perfect breeze to wire up it takes maybe 15 minutes to put in um, we run a fan off a 110 inverter up here I run a three horsepower sump pump when we're transferring water around and this system doesn't even blink it may dip on the voltage a little bit but if it's sunny out it goes right back up to full capacity while I'm using uh, the system 
So I'm very happy with the Renergy kit. I'm going to be buying another Renergy kit when we do the barn. This is 100 watts. We're probably going to look towards some, something like a kilowatt on the barn. Um, you know, some add-ons to a system like this, for example. In the barn, you know, we're going to have the three toads. We're going to have plenty of rainwater. We're going to have the animals. We plan to be milking goats in the barn. So one of the things that I want to add on to that is a hot water system. And what we can do is just run a 110 volt inverter that will actually run a portable hot water heater. And then a 20 pound propane tank can provide the fuel for that heater. And we can have hot water at the barn. So we're completely remote up here. We're about close to 800 to 1000 feet from the house. So no option for power, no option for water. But this is working great. I'm really happy you know, with the system. You know, it's a, it's a little expensive up front when you're buying the, the Life PO4 batteries and you're buying, you know, a nice brand like Renogy or something like that. But in my opinion, it's worth it. I, I don't worry about it. You know, it's, it's going to be here. It's expandable. We can use it for other things. We can use it for camping. So I'm really happy with it. I hope you enjoyed this type of video. Um, I hope that somebody that's designing an off-grid kit can find this information useful. Uh, it took me a lot of a lot of time and, and energy to <laughs> kind of put all this together back when we were designing the shed in the garden. So I'm glad I got to share it. Um, I really wish I could have done it earlier, but you know we've just been really busy with the garden, and this seems to be like a good time to do this you know type of content. If it helped you out, please let me know in the comments down below. For everybody else, I hope I kept you entertained. And I just want to thank everybody again for their support. Please like this video and consider subscribing to our channel. If you haven't checked this out on Instagram and Facebook, at Meadow Green Homesteading, we like to post daily content on there as well if you're interested. So again, thank you, and we'll see you next time.